I started to realize that almost everything that I was doing, the food that I was eating, the car that I was driving, and the gas that I was pumping into it, the trash that I was creating, all the cheap junk that I was buying, even the water that I was drinking in San Diego was being pumped across the desert where half of it was soaking into the desert and, and evaporating before even getting to us. And the Colorado River was running dry. So I learned that even the water that I was drinking was causing destruction. And so I realized that basically everything that I was doing was causing destruction to other people, to other species, to the earth as a whole. And I wasn't okay with that because that's not the life that I thought I was living. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 344. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Each week, we'll bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, we are speaking with Rob Greenfield. He's an activist and humanitarian dedicated to leading the way to a more sustainable and just world. He embarks on extreme projects to bring attention to important global issues and inspire positive change. And we get into a couple of his experiments in today's chat, one of them being wearing a suit made from his trash throughout New York City, and another was growing and foraging all of his food for a year in Orlando, Florida. So this was a really interesting conversation. And Rob's life is an embodiment of Gandhi's philosophy, be the change you wish to see in the world. Yeah, we get into so much in this one. Just have a really raw, organic, interesting, in-depth conversation, and we cover so much. Some of the highlights include healthy ways to purge your items, the dark side of donating to thrift stores, downsizing to 111 possessions. This is something Rob did at one point in his journey. Saying goodbye to his driver's license, social security card, and bank card, and living a life with no bills and no cell phone. Can you imagine? So much great stuff in this one. I know you're going to enjoy it, and we'd really appreciate if you get something from this to share it with somebody in your life, a friend, a family member, help spread the good word, and we thank you ahead of time. So without further ado, here we go with Rob Greenfield. Hello, Rob. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Hey, Jesse. Uh, very good. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's my pleasure. We got a lot to get into. I know this is a really exciting time for you because not too long ago, you actually just finished up a year-long experiment where you're living in Orlando and you are growing and foraging your food for a year. So what an incredible feat. Congrats on finishing that. To start off, if you had to summarize that experience into one word, what would that be? I don't know how that would be possible. Let's go with food. <laughs> there was a lot of food involved. <laughs> and I want to put a pin in that because we're definitely going to get into that whole adventure and, and go deep. But first, I think we should go back and get a little bit of context on, on you and your journey to that point. Let's go all the way back to growing up in Wisconsin. And I know you grew up with three other siblings. Your mom was raising you guys and you guys were in a low income situation and, and living in a small house. So take us back there. I grew up in northern Wisconsin, small town of Ashland. Population was 8,620, according to the sign at the time. It was just my mom and my three siblings and I. Definitely had, in many ways, a pretty comfortable upbringing. It was a beautiful place. It was very peaceful. It was, you know, a safe place to be. So much to be appreciative for. My mom made about somewhere around $15,000 a year to support four kids. So we were definitely pretty low income. That definitely had a, a lot of challenges. I mean, in many ways, influenced my early years of what I was pursuing in life. I was very insecure about our family not having much money and also about our family being different. So that actually resulted in me basically striving for the American dream. I just wanted to be kind of normal and fit in. I made the goal of being a millionaire and, you know, having a nice house and nice car and nuclear family since we didn't have that. So for a long time, that became definitely one of the central focus of my life. It was largely just about fitting in, growing up in a small town where people kind of talk about the same things and, you know, do the same things. That was kind of a big goal of mine was to just sort of fit in. I know part of your childhood, I'm not sure exactly what age this was, but you became a collector and you talk about collecting different things. And I know one of those things, actually your biggest collection was your Beanie Babies. So this is a stark contrast to the man you become today. 
But where do you think that inkling to collect things came from? Well, yeah, so definitely I absolutely grew up as a collector. Like you said, Beanie Babies. I actually had over 700 Beanie Babies during the peak of my Beanie Baby collection was about fifth and sixth grade. My house, my siblings and my mom, we collected stuff. It was toys, like every action figure, cards, comics, for me, coins and rocks, pogs. I don't know if you remember that game. It's like these little melt caps. Oh, totally. We collected everything. And I'm pretty confident that for me, a big part of it was finding self-worth. I could be meaningful through my collections of stuff. And You know, I think that's something that I picked up from American society, that your level of meaningfulness comes from your stuff, how nice your car and house and your material possessions are. And so for me, I think that I was partially filling a hole in myself and trying to put on a facade of who I was through stuff. You know, I think that was very much a big part of it. A big part of your childhood, too, was spending time outside. I know you loved being out in nature. You talk about catching frogs, turtles, and fishing, which sounds a lot like my childhood. So I can totally relate and had a true love for those same things as a kid. Yeah, absolutely. That was definitely my passion. That's what I dreamed of. If I wasn't able to be down at the lake or at a pond catching turtles and fish and letting them go, Then I was uh, at home reading National Geographic or watching Discovery Channel or whatever I could get my hands and my eyes on. Just that's what I was so passionate about was just animals and the outdoors. So that was kind of the interesting mix for me because that was my other life goal was just to spend my life outside and exploring the natural wonders of the world and really connecting deeply. But at the same time, I also had this dream, this very materialistic dream. And in some ways, those kind of clashed. I would say that in my mid-teens and then up to my mid-20s for about a decade, I would say that largely the quest for material possessions and financial wealth took over more so than, you know, the desire to be more connected to nature. I mean, I still was, but basically I, I realized that those two things clashed in the sense that that quest for material possessions was the thing that was destroying the things that I loved without me realizing it as I started to educate myself on the environmental issues of our times and and how our actions, we're, we're not in nature, and I'm saying that with quotes around it, we're at home, but our lives are nature. And so that's when I realized that actually I was having a not so great impact on the world just through my daily actions at home when I wasn't out hiking and fishing and being out there. I know you went to college. Did you get out of state or where'd you go? I stayed in Wisconsin. Originally, my plan was to go to Florida or Oregon for marine biology. And then I ended up deciding to stay in Wisconsin for a year. I went to University of Wisconsin Lacrosse. I didn't play lacrosse. The name of the city is lacrosse. People are always confused when I say that. But yeah, so I studied biology, chemistry, and aquatic science. And basically, I ended up just really loving it there and making so many friends that I just couldn't imagine going to a new university after that. And once you graduate, you travel across the world. You went over to Southeast Asia and Africa and spent about five months just traveling. So was this the first time you went overseas or had you already traveled there before? As a kid, I always had just the strongest desire to get out of northern Wisconsin. I think I always wanted to see the world. I mean, I remember reading things like Dr. Doolittle, where he's traveling across the Polynesian islands and he's finding these rare fish. And I just remember as a kid just being so fascinated by tropical places and wanting to explore. And so I started to do that at a pretty young age. When I was 16, I hopped on a Greyhound bus, which was 48 hours from northern Wisconsin to Florida. And that was my first time, you know, heading out into the world on my own. And at that time, that was a pretty crazy adventure for me, you know, coming from a little town of 8,000 people that we only had one stoplight, one elevator. It was the only place with a movie theater in the entire county. So for me to head on a Greyhound, like down through Atlanta and all of that was one of my early adventures. And then I started to travel abroad in university. For me, the easiest thing was going down to Mexico. And that was just a dream at the time to get out of Wisconsin and go to Mexico. And then I started to travel. I think I went to Argentina and Colombia. And then 
I did a sort of study abroad program my, my junior year, which brought me to Australia and New Zealand. So during university, I managed to get out into the world and travel. Basically, I think a few weeks after I graduated university, that's when I just had a backpack of basic possessions, camping gear, and just set out to try to go to places where I wouldn't find anyone who spoke my language and just put myself into wild places. Was that trip really transformative for you? I don't remember if it was really transformative. So that was in 2009, so 10 years ago. There's no question it had to have been really impactful just to do that for the first time. But I don't remember if it was transformative. I guess it was a couple of years later that I feel like I really started to change my life. So it may have planted a bunch of seeds and it certainly was impactful, but I don't know if it was really transformative. Okay, we're going to get to the big transformation in 2011 here soon. But I'm just curious, you come back from this trip, spending five months abroad, and at that time when you come back in your headspace, are you still thinking you're going to pursue that dream to become a millionaire and work more of a classical lifestyle? Or where's your headspace at that point? Yes, I guess I was about 23 years old. And so I came back. Basically, at the time, I was working as an independent contractor for some nationwide marketing companies. We sold advertising on grocery store shopping carts and on the back of the receipts. Like We put coupons on the back of there and we put little ads on the shopping carts. So I was building a business through these companies as an independent contractor. And so at that time, my plan was to be doing that across the country, to be training people, to be selling advertising across the country where I'm their manager and I'd be getting a portion of that and then selling myself. I got right to work on that as soon as I got back. So yes, at that time, no doubt I was still extremely focused on on money and very much planning to be a millionaire and on that path. So six months go by and you decide to leave Wisconsin. You go down to San Diego, you just pack up your car and go. What's the catalyst for this move? Well, thankfully, it was a woman. <laughs> um, I wanted to get out of Wisconsin, but I kind of ended up back there because a former girlfriend and I sort of rekindled things. It ended up just basically putting me in a place where my heart was just, I guess you could say, broken. We were involved, but not really. And it was just impossible for me to really concentrate and think and be happy. So I just said, I got I to gotta go as far away from here as I can. And so I just packed up my car and I, I didn't know exactly where I was going, but I ended up in Florida. So a good 1500 miles away from her. That's what resulted in me getting out of Wisconsin in the time that I did. And I'm glad that everything went that way because you never know. I mean, if that hadn't happened, maybe I'd have just stayed there. So you went down to Florida first and then over to San Diego? Yeah. So I ended up just spending a month in Florida. And actually, it was one of the most boring months of my entire life. I ended up staying in this area that was mostly elders. And I just remember being so tired and sleeping for like a month. And then I had a business opportunity and decided to drive to San Diego. So popped back in the car and headed across the country, took a couple of weeks and got to San Diego where at the time I didn't know anyone on the way out there. I learned that one person I knew lived out there. So I just put into the GPS at the time, like a spot on the ocean. And that's where I showed up. Before you take off and initially leave Wisconsin, I know you had everything packed up in your car when you went. Did you do some kind of minimalist experiment at that time and pare down all your stuff? Or did you just leave everything back at your home? Is this the beginning of the whole minimalist thing? No doubt. At the time, I still had things stored in places. At that time, you know, I'd only graduated a couple of years prior from university. So I had stuff at, back at my mom's house. But I also had been in a place where a big goal of mine was to not have too much stuff and not get tied down. Yeah, I wish I knew exactly then how much I did have. But I think that most of what I had fit into the trunk of my car at the time. And at that time, you know, I was definitely not as... As I said, I was into some material possessions and everything, but at the same time, I was pretty focused on not getting tied down, and I was really focused on not having a mortgage, and, and actually, there's a note. I was just searching for it. This note is from January 28th, June 28th, 2010, so that's right about that time, and it says in all caps, no house, no large bills, no loans, no large possessions, stay mobile, don't get tied down. 
So I was very focused on making sure that I remained free. But at that time, I saw freedom through having lots of money, just not tying myself down through things like mortgages and bills and loans and such. So when you arrived in San Diego, did you have a lot of money saved at that point? I doubt it. I always was pretty good at managing my finances. So I definitely didn't show up in a situation where I was, as some people would say, broke. And I probably had some thousands of dollars, maybe 5,000 or 10,000. But back then, one of the things I did really well is I worked the credit cards where I would transfer them over from one to the next for 0% interest and like earn my miles by starting new credit cards and such. I do remember that someone had borrowed $10,000 from me at that time through one of my credit cards, my business partner at the time, who never ended up paying me back. So I know that I was in debt now that I think about it, but I also know that I had some money. Paint a picture of what it's like when you arrive in San Diego. You show up, you have your car full of possessions. Obviously, it's a stark contrast being over in California versus Wisconsin. So what was it like? I mean, for me at that time, I was just extremely excited about life. You know, leaving Wisconsin and arriving in Southern California. I mean, Southern California is the dream for many people. It's such an amazing, comfortable place. For me, I think one of the things that I really, really enjoyed was that I didn't feel judged. Whereas in Wisconsin, it's a place where a lot of people kind of do the same thing. And to step outside of it is pretty noticeable. And having grown up being so self-conscious about that, The thing that was amazing about California, about San Diego, and San Diego is not like Northern California. It's still in many ways pretty conservative, but basically I could do whatever I wanted here and worry a lot less what people were thinking about me. So for me, it was really a time of exploration of, I remember just continuing to do things and see like, whoa, I can do this and sort of exploring my own personal boundaries and and what was possible. So, yeah, I mean, those first couple of years in California were definitely some of the best years of my life. It was a very exciting time. When you arrived, what year would that have been? That was 2011, January of 2011. Man, it might have even been January 17th today. So basically nine years ago, exactly, almost. Wow. 2011 is the year of your awakening. So I know this wasn't an epiphany that hit you all of a sudden. It was more of a gradual thing. Take us back to that time and some of the things that were presented to you that started to quote unquote wake you up. Basically what happened when I got out here is I was in a more comfortable scenario that allowed me to explore things. And also I surrounded myself with different people. I remember a lot of my friends went to Pacific College of Oriental Medicine for acupuncture and massage therapy. So I was surrounding myself with people that were pretty open-minded and looking at life through a different lens. And it was around that time, basically, that I started to watch a lot of documentaries and read a lot of books and just started to realize that my life wasn't what I thought it was. A lot of what I was doing, I was only doing because corporations had large advertising budgets and had sold me on the idea that I needed these products or needed these service to be, you know, a happy, healthy human, to be a contributing member of society. And then at the same time, so basically I realized that a lot of what I was doing was based on lies that had been sold to me. And then at the same time, I started to realize that almost everything that I was doing, the food that I was eating, the car that I was driving, and the gas that I was pumping into it, the trash that I was creating, all the cheap junk that I was buying, even the water that I was drinking in San Diego was being pumped across the desert where half of it was soaking into the desert and and evaporating before even getting to us. And the Colorado River was running dry. So I learned that even the water that I was drinking was causing destruction. And so I realized that basically everything that I was doing was causing destruction to other people, to other species, to the earth as a whole. And I wasn't okay with that because that's not the life that I thought I was living. I considered myself someone who cared, but I realized that my actions did not show love, they actually showed destruction. And so that's between realizing that my life was largely a lie and that my life was destroying what I loved, I quickly decided that I had to change my life. When you had this epiphany, and again, I know it wasn't just an overnight thing, but when you started to change that mindset, were you angry? Were you sad? Were you optimistic? What kind of feelings went through your head? Definitely a lot of different feelings. I mean, I definitely had my days of doom and gloom, you know, just realizing all the problems in the world. 
and just realizing I was a part of them and uncovering these truths, there was definitely anxiety and stress and just what am I going to do? But for the most part, what I felt was excited and empowered because these documentaries I was watching and these books I was reading didn't just tell me the problems that existed in the world. They also talked about solutions. They talked about other ways of living, other ways of meeting our basic needs to live more in alignment with the earth and the ecosystems that give us life. And so I was empowered because I knew how to change my life. And I was excited because I could. I was in a place in my life where I could decide to make changes. So that was just a very exciting time for me. And I became just extremely passionate about sustainability, about understanding my life. Basically, my job became to unravel the two and a half decades of my life that I had wound up at that point, unravel it all, relearn, and then start putting things back together in a way where I could feel really good about my life and my actions. What is starting to put things back together look like in the early days? Starting to put things back together meant stripping a lot of things out in the first place. Just for an example, I mean, I remember watching The Story of Stuff was one of the early short videos that I watched. It's about 20 minutes. I remember one of the things, they have a story of cosmetics and I learned about all the toxic things I was putting on my body and in my body. You know, the deodorant, the face wash, the hair conditioner and shampoo, the mouthwash, the hair gel, like all of these had ingredients in them, chemically synthesized ingredients that I didn't want on my body. So that meant just taking all that stuff and just putting it on the curb and getting it out of my house and saying either I'm going to replace it with something that's not toxic to my body or I'm going to replace it with something that feels right, that isn't toxic. And it was little things like that to the food that I was eating, you know, starting to shop at local farmers markets and buying food from local farmers rather than food that's packaged in plastic and shipped halfway around the world and putting in double plastic bags at the big box store. You know, just simply instead of going to the store and filling my cart as I saw things, instead really starting to say, do I actually need this? Do I actually want this? Is this going to bring me happiness? And just buying a lot less stuff that it turned out I didn't need starting to ride my bike more and drive the car a lot less, just parking the car. At the time, I would drive a half mile to the grocery store and then realizing, well, I don't need to drive to the grocery store. It's a half mile away. I can walk or ride a bike. Starting to cook whole foods rather than you know microwaving and frozen pizzas and stuff, like starting to actually cook meals and become a better cook. So there was, I would say, hundreds of changes that I made over those first few years. And key words there, a few years, this wasn't an overnight thing or within a week or even a month or two, you know, you took your time and plugged away over a period of time. And I think that's important for the listener who might just be learning about a lot of this and, and starting to make positive changes that, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. This takes time. Yeah, it absolutely takes time. And so what I did is I made a list of all the changes that I wanted to make. I've always been visually goal oriented. So for me, writing something down makes it a reality and then puts it in a place where I'll see it and be able to stick to it. So I put my goals up in my kitchen on a piece of paper or I'd see them every day. And my goal was that I was going to make one positive change per week at least. And, you know, I taped a pen right next to it with a string on the wall so that I could check those off and have that visual and that helped with motivation because I saw the progress and I could also look back and see, okay, here's what I have done. It was very strategic. It was, here's what I have to do. Here are my short-term goals. Here are my long-term goals. And then putting it all together. What was amazing that worked so well is that more than they had these little successes, they basically built upon each other. And for example, starting to ride my bike more, starting to drink less alcohol, and starting to eat local whole foods from the farmer's market and things, all those things made me feel a lot better. I was feeling a lot healthier and happier. And then that made it easier to make other changes as well, because I was empowered and because I was motivated. And so it really worked together to continue making those changes. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Rob to give a shout out to our show partner, Organifi. Organifi has a red juice powder that contains superfood ingredients 
to strengthen your immune system and energize your body. And it also gives your metabolism a boost. It contains cordyceps, rhodiola, Siberian ginseng, reishi mushroom, acai, and beets, along with pomegranate, raspberry, cranberry, blueberry, and strawberry. This product is totally loaded. It tastes delicious as well. This is a drink you're going to totally crave. To make a red juice, all you need to do is take a scoop of the powder, mix it with a cup of filtered water, stir, and you're ready to go. I love how easy this is to incorporate all these nutrients into my daily routine. And all Organifi products are organic, gluten-free, soy-free, vegan, and keto-friendly. What more could you ask for? As a listener of our show, you also get a 20% discount on your Organifi purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. Go and get yourself some of the red juice powder today and give your immune system a boost. Now we're going to give a shout out to our other show partner, Beekeepers Naturals. Beekeepers Naturals has a propolis spray, which is a natural immune support. It comes in a small spray bottle so you can take it with you everywhere, and it's perfect for boosting your immune system at home or on the go. For bulletproof immunity, you take three to four sprays of propolis one or two times a day, and when periods of stress increase, you can take four to five sprays of propolis up to five times a day, so up your dosage. To encourage healthy skin, you can also spray it on minor scrapes, minor burns, and blemishes. Once you give this product a try, you're going to want to have it on hand at all times, and they also make a propolis throat spray for kids, so make sure and pick them up a bottle too. And as a listener of our show, you get 15% off all the Beekeepers products by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. And if you spend $60 or more, you get free shipping. Upgrade your natural medicine cabinet by picking up some of this propolis spray. You're going to love it. And now back to our chat with Rob. An important point to highlight, at least for me, as I've been on my own journey of health and wellness and continuing to evolve and grow, is that we're never actually there. There is a period of time like you're talking about, maybe it's a few years where we're really plugging away and making big changes. But in the big scheme of things, this epiphany period for you happened in 2011. We're now in 2020. So that's only nine years of your life. So, you know, you've changed so much in this period of time. It would be expected, you know, you're still a young guy and you have a long life ahead of you that, you know, this journey is going to continue to unravel throughout the rest of your life for me and for you and for everybody else. It's definitely a continued path. I'm happy to say that. You know, I set up the foundation where I've done a lot of the work and now it's more about maintaining it and sticking to it. But of course, I'm always learning and I'm always trying to do more and always growing. And, you know, sometimes you go backwards a little bit. Definitely some of the things that I was doing extremely well a few years ago, I'm not doing as well now. But it's always about, for me, just trying to do a good job, do a great job. It's definitely not about doing things perfectly because that's just not really realistic. Where along the journey did you really pare down? I know, again, when you left Wisconsin, you didn't have a whole lot of stuff. But when did you really make that commitment? Because I know you took it really extreme at one point and got down to 111 items. We can get there in a second and talk about what period that was. But when did you really get in there and start paring down, you know, the moderate amount of stuff you had at that point? Well, I really started that pretty much right away when I started to wake up. I just realized that the stuff I didn't need it. It was actually taking away from my life. It was making it harder to really be free and do what I wanted to do. And it was also requiring money, whether it's the insurance or the maintenance or updating. And along with updating, you know, the more electronics items I had, the more time I remember doing the updates that would pop up on the iPad, the computer, the iPhone, you know, having all these things. So much of the whole journey that I've been talking about was getting rid of stuff, simplifying so that I'd made time to do what I really wanted and created a life where I was free and able to focus on health and happiness and living more sustainably. That happened right away. And over those years, what I basically started to do is I would look at my possessions. I would ask myself, have I used this in the last six months to a year? And if the answer was no, that was, you know, okay, maybe I can get rid of this. And also, does this bring value to my life? Is this useful? 
Or is this taking time away from my life? Is this adding clutter? Is this not valuable to me? And so I would ask those questions and get rid of stuff. And often what I would do is I would literally go through everything in the house, maybe over a period of a couple days, and I would cut my stuff in half. And then six months to 12 months later, I'd do it again and I'd cut my stuff in half. And that's basically what I did is I just continued to cut myself in half and half and half. And I started in my apartment. I had a three bedroom apartment at the time. I would rent the rooms out to other people generally. And I started in the biggest bedroom because I had a lot of stuff. Then I moved to the smaller one, then the smaller one. Then I moved into a six by six closet. All my stuff could fit in there just long enough for me to sleep diagonally in it. And then eventually I you know, got rid of the apartment altogether. And that's when I decided to live in a very small house in San Diego. <laughs> For people that are starting on this journey and starting to rid themselves of all the extra things, what are some of the ways that you did that? Were you selling things online? Were you donating, putting things at the curb? Just can you give us an idea of different ways in a healthy way that we can purge? Yeah, definitely all of those. A lot of times I would give things to people as long as I felt like it was going to be meaningful and they would use it. A lot of things I sold. And for me, that was easy because if it's something that I could sell and get a reasonable amount for, then I always knew, well, I could just buy one again in the future if it turns out I need it, which of course, most of the time it turns out you don't need any of those things, but it provides that safety net by selling some of those things that you now have the funds and you could just buy one later if needed. And I buy most things used, so that drastically decreases the costs of things and also holds the value. What I often did is I would buy something used, and then I could sell it for the same price as I bought it for. Definitely donating to thrift stores. A lot of things I would donate to thrift stores. But something to keep in mind with that is a lot of the stuff that goes to thrift stores does often end up being thrown away or just shipped off to other countries where it actually becomes a burden. So I try to minimize that because sometimes the intentions there are great, but it doesn't actually work out to be great. Other things include just having people over and having a downsizing party, you could say, where you have all the stuff you want to get rid of, have it out in a room and just have a party where people can come and take things. So they're like a free garage sale, but for friends to take meaningful things. Another thing that I would do is some things I would either give to a friend or sell to a friend at a really good price, and then just ask if I could use it on occasion. If it was something that I would, for example, I used to stand up paddleboard, but I didn't do it very often. If I could give that to a friend or sell it to a friend at a reasonable price and just say, hey, could I use this every once in a while? Then it's something that's actually getting used and providing value to them. And and then I could still actually get to use it on occasion. And that actually goes perfectly in alignment with renting. I got rid of my car in 2012. And I did the math and I calculated that it would make more sense to just rent a car. If I wanted to go camping once a month, I could just rent a car for a weekend or a week. We also had a car share program in San Diego that I would use, an electric car share program. So I did start sharing a lot more. There were things that I could rent. It all added up financially because I could live in a smaller place, which meant spending less money on rent. I didn't have insurance. And financially, it made sense to borrow a lot of things or rent a lot of things rather than than owning them. Yeah, when I was preparing for this and going through a lot of your material online, that was one thing that really hit me. The fact that a lot of us are within our, our home, we have one of everything. And there's such an opportunity for us to share, especially things that we're not using day in, day out, like you mentioned your stand-up paddleboard. So things like tools or, I don't know, I'm just going to brainstorm here, things like a power washer maybe, different things that everybody on the block owns and we're using so infrequently. It just makes no sense. Yeah, it definitely makes no sense. There's a statistic out there, and I don't know if it's accurate, but it's something like the average electric drill gets used for a total of 30 minutes in its entire lifetime. I don't know if that statistic is accurate, but it is deeply meaningful and proves a point. And that is that, yeah, most of these things that we have do sit and they sit for, you know, 99% of the time, they're just sitting there. So if we can share those resources instead, not everybody has to have a lawnmower, for example, a few neighbors can share that you're only mowing for an hour once a week or some people once a month. 
So it makes sense financially. It makes sense for connecting our communities and getting to know each other better. And it also makes sense resource-wise. If 10 people share a lawnmower, that's 10 times less lawnmowers that are needed, which is massively impactful. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. And I like how you mentioned the community aspect too and connecting with our neighbors. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was one of the biggest parts about all these things is everything is interconnected. So as I was making these changes, the idea was to live a more sustainable life. But really, I realized it was about a more connected life. It was about a more meaningful life. It was about living out my values. And a lot of that came through community. It was connecting with other people rather than living in this monetary system where I think I'm independent because I can buy everything that I need. And then I think I don't need people, but there's somebody behind every dollar that I passed over. I realized that I am completely dependent upon humanity. I am completely dependent upon other people. And there was a complete delusion that I thought I was independent of all this. And so for me, I decided to embrace that and say, yeah, I need people. And I don't want to need them in a way where I'm just spending money and destruction is happening on the other side of the world without me seeing it. Instead, I want to just get to know my neighbors. I want to get to know my community. And in doing so, be able to connect with people and understand how my my actions affect them and other people and other species. And so, yeah, simply knowing your neighbor is a pretty powerful thing today. For sure. Earlier, you touched on the fact that when we're donating things, we must be aware because sometimes they're going to get thrown out or the problem or problems that can be caused when they get shipped overseas. So can you talk more about the shipping overseas and and what that causes? Sure. The thing is, a lot of what we do is it comes from a good place. You know, we want to do the right thing. But the thing about our current lives, we live in a globalized time where most everything that we do in a day it doesn't just impact people near us. It impacts people in far off places, often halfway around the world. So when we donate our clothes to a thrift shop, we would just assume, okay, these clothes are probably going to stay around here. But we have such an overabundance that the United States is clothed. We have more clothes than we can possibly deal with. And so people can't buy all these clothes at the thrift stores. There's just way too many. So what's often done with these clothes is they're sold by the pallet or the pound or donated. And it often goes to countries like in the Caribbean, like Haiti or the Dominican Republic, different parts of Africa, many places around the world. And basically what we're doing is we're dumping all of these clothes into these countries. And then imagine you're a local business, whether it's textiles or clothing, and the price of this stuff coming from the United States is 10 times less you just go out of business. There's just not a market there for you anymore. And so what we're actually doing is weakening local economies and weakening communities. It results in working together less and not needing each other and instead having this cheap junk dropped. And then also, it can just drastically reduce culture by bringing in our cheap Western clothing. That can change things quite a bit as well. Would you recommend doing further digging, like if we're going to donate to a thrift store just to see if where that is going to end up. You can certainly research the thrift shops that you're donating to and find out, do they keep things locally or do they ship things around the country or around the world? And a lot of local thrift shops don't do that. So you can actually find out. Another thing is to find meaningful homes directly for it. So if it's your friends or if it's a fellow student at school or a colleague, if you can find someone who actually wants the item and can use it, then that can be meaningful as well. But the tricky thing is if you have so much stuff and you're trying to downsize and free yourself, then it would take just years to give each item individually. It's a tricky place that we are in. So how long did it take you, Rob, to get down to 111 items? And was this the lowest amount of items you've had or have you gone lower than that? After simplifying at my apartment and then after moving into the tiny house where I lived for a year in San Diego, then I decided that I was going to travel. And my goal, my dream was to have everything I owned fit into a backpack. And that's when I got my life down to 111 possessions. 
So I think they weighed a total of 37 pounds. So it was a pretty small backpack overall. And actually, I did that for two years. And then I ended up living in Florida for two years in a tiny house that I built. And I accrued some possessions during that time. But I left Florida a couple months ago. And now everything that I own fits in a backpack again. I have not counted the possessions, but I think it's less than 111 this time. What does it feel like when you get your possessions down to that little? Like, is it scary at all or it just feels amazing? Just because a lot of us are never going to get there. But what, what is that like? For me, it's not really scary at all. I think that's because of a, you know, a feeling of completeness. A lot of people, when they think of getting rid of stuff, they think of giving something up. They think maybe it will create a hole in themselves, you know. But the reality is, is that for me, getting rid of stuff isn't about creating a hole. It's about creating space that then I can then fill with something that is far more meaningful. And so I might have less stuff, but I'm more full than I ever was before. I have more passion. I'm more excited about life. I feel my actions are in alignment with my beliefs, which is a a sense of completeness that just makes life so much better for me personally. It's a sense of being complete by having less by appreciating what I do have and just knowing that I don't need all of this stuff and that I can be happy without it. And it really has allowed me the time to do what I really want to be doing. Because there's just so many people out there, they're not really doing what they want to be doing in life because they think they need so much money and so much stuff. And then so much time and energy has to go into that, that they're not really able to pursue their passions. And so I've really freed up my life to be able to pursue living in a way where it's really meaningful and it's what I want to be doing. Part of your paring down, you have a YouTube video on this, was getting rid of your bank card, your social security, and your driver's license. So you actually chop those up. And the paper ones, you actually had a little fire, a little ceremony type thing and burn those. So was that a scary move for you? It was not a scary move for me because I had done a lot of research prior and I think things out quite a bit. You know, a lot of people might see what I do and they just assume it's on a whim, on the moment. But the reality is, is that I really research things before I do them. So yeah, that was about four years ago. And at that time, I got rid of my bank account. I think I got rid of my last credit card. Well, I think I got rid of my last credit card already, but got rid of my driver's license and then also got rid of my social security card. I got my life down to just two IDs. I have my passport and my birth certificate, and those are my only two forms of ID. And now I currently don't have a bank account, a credit card, a single online financial account. And it's extremely freeing. The money that I do use is cash, generally. Occasionally, if I need to buy something online, I'll just have someone else purchase it, and then I give them cash. For a lot of people, it would be terrifying. But for me, it just allows me to be really present I'm very present where I am and with what I'm doing generally, not perfect by any means. Presentness is, a, is a, something that I'm always working on doing a better job at. But compared to where I was before, I'm pretty present in the world that I'm in and in the, in the moment and where I am. We talked about cutting up the bank card, which leads to, well, you mentioned as well that you basically work in cash. So for you, I know the way you get your cash is by doing speaking engagements. I'm just curious, you have something too, one of your vows, I think this is one of your vows, where you want to make sure you're earning under $15,000 a year. So talk about that. It was about four or five years ago that I decided that I would make less than the federal poverty threshold. And that's a vow, a commitment that I made for life. The federal poverty threshold is around $12,000 for an individual person like myself. It varies from year to year. And it's not about simulating poverty at all. I don't live in poverty. I live an extremely privileged life that makes all of this very possible for me that wouldn't really be possible for many of people in the world. But for me, that personal commitment and also public commitment to earning less than the federal poverty threshold, it's many things. It's a commitment to simplicity. It's a commitment to not being attached to money. It's a commitment to keeping my voice honest and truthful and not being able to be swayed by money. When you look at politicians today and a lot of our leaders, they're bought by money. And so if I can take away that need for money, then it it really takes away the ways that I can be swayed and not do the right thing. 
So personally, it's a way to help me stick to my ethics and morals. And then the more money you have, the easier it is just to buy things without paying attention to the impacts that it has. So this forces me to live simply like I'd like to. And the challenging thing about today is we have everything that we could desire or want materially available to us very easily, often just at the click of a button. And so I put basically barriers in place to make things less convenient, to make things harder so that I don't just splurge in the moment and buy things that I don't need. So for me, it's a, it is partly about putting controls to make sure that I'm doing what I want. And then another big thing is just we live in a time of great wealth inequality, something like the top 1% of the world's population owns 50% of the wealth. I don't know the exact statistic, but it's totally absurd. You know, in a world where we have so much, there's so many people that just don't have remotely enough, you know, food, a safe place to live, education. And for me, I can't rationalize having so much while others have so little. This commitment is is about shifting funds to places where it's needed. 100% of my media income is donated to nonprofits. Most of my speaking income as well. This year, 100% of my speaking is donated to indigenous and women-led environmental nonprofits. So it's definitely... As some people say, money makes the world go around. It doesn't. The world goes around without it. But money is at the center of most of our lives. It's definitely a complicated thing, and there's a lot of ways to look at it, and there's a lot of ways that I have looked at it. But that gives a bit of an idea as to why I've committed to not focusing on money and, and really focusing on, on minimizing the way that money is involved in my life and the amount that's involved. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Part of that too, that ties into all this, at the end of every month, you have no bills, you're actually not paying rent or paying a mortgage. And I want to talk about quickly how that works. And another thing you let go of, which is quite essential to most of us these days is a cell phone. So how long has it been since you got rid of the cell phone? And how do you end up finding places to live? I know you just got done this experiment that we keep alluding to, and we're going to get into very shortly. But now that that's done, how do you pay for a place to stay and, and where are you staying? I got rid of my cell phone in about 2014, I think 2015. So it's been, I think over five years. That was the last bill that I had. And that was very challenging. I remember my, my roommate, Greg, when I first started making changes in my life, I remember he had not a smartphone, but just a little flip phone. And I had an iPhone at the time. And I just remember looking at that and just being amazed. How can you do this, Greg? And I was intrigued. I wanted to live without a cell phone and to be present. And at that time, I couldn't even imagine living without a smartphone, let alone the idea of no phone at all. It was something that at first I did not know how I would do it. But my earliest step, it was a Thanksgiving day. And I just said, I'm going to actually leave my phone at home and go over to Thanksgiving dinner at my friends and just spend the day without my phone and just be completely present. And that was the first time in the United States. When I traveled abroad, I didn't have a cell phone. But in the United States, like in just general life, not having a phone. And I remember just driving over there in the electric car share and just being like, nobody can reach me. I'm just, I'm here. And I remember texting them saying, I'm going to drive over soon. I don't have a cell phone, so you won't be able to reach me. So I'll just be there. And that day was a beautiful present day. So I just started practicing putting my phone into the drawer and turning it off. And then towards the end, what I did is I did a little experiment where I shut my phone off for a month, put it in a drawer and tested, can I exist without a phone? And it worked well. So I finally got rid of my cell phone after that went well. And I patted myself on the chest and I saw, okay, you're still here. Like I was checking to see if I was still there. And sure enough, that's what I kept doing over and over after getting rid of things and just finding that, okay, my friends are still my friends. Life is still good. And I have time to be present. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Rob to give a shout out to our show partner, Sun Warrior. Sun Warrior has a brand new product out called Clean Keto. It contains clean fat from coconut MCT oil combined with fava bean protein, fermented pea protein, and protein peptides from fermented brown rice. It provides fast energy and helps curb cravings. It also includes essential vitamins and minerals required by our bodies. And what Marnie and I have been doing lately when we have the occasional grain-free cereal for breakfast is we'll take coconut milk 
and we'll blend it with a couple ingredients, one of them being Sun Warrior's Clean Keto, and this upgrades the milk before pouring it over the cereal. And Clean Keto is soy-free, it's gluten-free, it's vegan, and it has no sugar added, and comes in chocolate and vanilla. Our favorite is the vanilla. As a listener of our show, you get 20% off your Sun Warrior purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash sunwarrior. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash sunwarrior. On top of your 20% discount, if you spend $50 or more, you get free shipping. Go and give the Clean Keto product a try today. It's new and it quickly became a favorite of ours and I know you're going to love it too. Now I'm going to share a review from one of our listeners, Laura B831 from Canada, titled My Favorite Health Podcast and she gave us five stars. Jesse and Marnie clearly put a lot of work into the podcast. The interviews are insightful, well planned out, and they obviously do their research. They don't stick to one type of person or topic and interview people on every different side of the spectrum, letting you decide what resonates with you and what your own individual needs are. Mind, body, and spirit are all incorporated in this holistic health podcast. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for the kind words. Really appreciate it. And if you haven't left us a review yet, it only takes a minute to do. And we've created a couple of infographics that make the process even easier. You can go and check those out over at ultimahealthpodcast.com slash review. And they'll take you step by step through the process. And Marty and I read each and every review and really appreciate you taking the time to do so. So thank you ahead of time. And now back to our chat with Rob. I'm just curious, what do you do for taking photos day to day? Do you have like a point and shoot or how does that work? I had an iPod touch. So I could use that as Wi-Fi and there's Wi-Fi in so many places. That's one of the reasons that it's easy to live without a phone. But I actually finally got rid of that about a month or two ago. So now I just, I don't have a camera. So now I just don't have a camera, which is new to me. This is, it's difficult because, you know, I obviously, I use social media, but what I do is when I'm with people, I'm with people a lot. I just say, can we take a photo? And then they just email it to me. That's how I take photos right now by sharing that resource in that time. Are you going to figure a way to post on Instagram or is that going to go on pause? No, I can post on Instagram through desktop. Oh, you can. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, I can't use stories. So I haven't done a story in quite some time, but I can still post photos. Okay. Okay. I didn't realize you could do that. Yeah, which works well. That's definitely one of the things that I'm constantly trying to figure out. I am trying to be present in the world and the computer makes it hard to do that. So that's kind of one of my constant battles of talking about like ultimate health. For me, ultimate health would come from presentness in the moment, which would mean being able to easily focus on food and being hydrated and exercising and being connected to the people around me. And the number one thing that's holding me back from ultimate health is too much time on the devices. For me, it's the computer and the internet that it's connected to. That's my biggest challenge. It has been for a long time. It's one of the things that I haven't overcome. You know, I'm making progress and who knows how that will go over life. That's one of my big focuses this year is having a good balance with the online world. Well, I mean, social media and these different electronic tools are so important to help, you know, spread your message and inspire people. So you're definitely being mindful of your usage. And I think that's the first step. Yeah, it's definitely about me being mindful. And with everything, it's like, you know, we live in a complicated time. So I definitely don't have a desire to overwhelm people or make them feel unempowered. But just simply being mindful is a revolutionary thing today. And that means having a balance. So for example, one of the greatest things for me was that I started to shut off my cell phone and computer at 8 p.m., give myself some time before sleep, and then try not to turn it on until a half hour after waking up. So that's massive. Just that presentness and having it off at night changed my sleep, changed my presentness. We live in an extreme society. We don't realize it because it's, it seems normal to us because it's what's around us. But the United States has 5% of the world's population, but uses 25% of the world's resources. And Canada is in that same realm. So it's not normal. The reality is, is that we are an extreme society compared to the global standard, the global norm. And so what I do is I go to the other end of that extreme to show people, to wake people up to the fact that this isn't normal, what we're doing. It only appears normal because it's what we see around us day after day after day. 
And so my goal by doing this extreme stuff is to bring people into moderation, just to question our actions. Why are we doing these things and what's the impact that it has? And then my goal is just to get people to make positive changes and move more into a, a, you could call it moderation, just reasonable, commonsensical way of living. Well, I know from my own experience, finding moderation a lot of times comes from testing extremes, whether it be diet or different things I've gone through in my life. And you don't obviously want to push it too far, but testing those boundaries in my life has been helpful to find, you know, my happy medium. Yes. And that's definitely testing the boundaries. And then you find that what does work for you. And the further you go, the more you realize what is possible. It's kind of like a pendulum. And so if I can go way to the other end of the extreme, then that just expands where I can go. And what would have been uncomfortable in the past compared to that extreme is quite comfortable. You know, I've biked across the United States three times. I've done these really enduring adventures like growing and foraging all my food for a year or living only off food from dumpsters. And these are the extremes, but I don't have those 100% extremes in my day-to-day life. Those are projects that take me deep and immerse me and help me understand. But then my life is actually still extreme compared to most people. But compared to what I've done, my day-to-day life is actually comfortable and moderate. Well, we can't not talk about the trash experiment, the trash suit. And just to give a bit of an idea before you jump in, this is an experiment you did in New York City, where for a whole month, you would live like a typical American, and you would wear the trash that you're accumulating. So I do want to come back to where you're living now and how you're paying for that. But first, just since we're on this tangent, let's talk about the trash suit. We live in a society where we create a lot of trash, but it's extremely easy to not notice it. We put it in the trash can, the garbage people come and pick it up, and it's out of sight, out of mind. But the reality is, is that the average person in the United States creates about four and a half pounds of trash per day on average. So what I wanted to do was create a visual to do something that would help people understand that and to shock them. So what I did was for a month, I just lived like the average American, went grocery shopping, you know, ate at restaurants, just ate, shopped, consumed like the average person does. But the catch was, is I had to wear every piece of trash that I created. And so each day I added all the garbage to a specially designed suit that could hold it. And each day I got a little bigger and a little bigger. And every day I walked around New York City and lived life. And people saw it and they would ask what I was doing. And I would say, I'm just living like the average American and wearing all my trash. And they would see it and they'd see like, wow, that's me. That is a reflection of my life. And so the visual, I didn't tell anybody what they were doing was wrong or right. I just created a visual that basically served as a reflection of our society. And the idea was that the visual was something that people wouldn't forget, that, you know, they would be opening up that bag of chips and they'd think of me covered in trash and it would, you know, make them think twice about buying the bag of chips next time. And so that was really the purpose of that project. And it was probably one of the most enjoyable months of my life. Tying that back to social media, now that you've done that, and not only had the impact of the people in New York City, that video is now on YouTube and people all around the world can see that and get that visual and get the impact that you intended. Yeah, I like to do things very much in real life, just, you know, being in New York City. I think social media is a great tool. And it's definitely something that I've used as videos to tell these stories. We are such a visual species, you know, it's easy to understand things for most of us if we see it. So a lot of my work is designed in a very visual way. And to answer your question, you know, as far as money, as far as rent goes, in San Diego when I lived in the tiny house and in Orlando when I lived in the tiny house, what I did is a work exchange. So I set the tiny house up in someone's backyard and in exchange for doing that, I, you know, helped them live more sustainably, grew food for them and set up composting and rainwater harvesting and just helped them on their path to trying to live a more sustainable life that they were passionate and excited about. And then as I'm traveling, right now I'm on a speaking tour for about a year. And so I just stay with generally the host of the talk that I'm giving. And so mostly I just am staying with people and generally a guest bedroom, sometimes on a couch in the living room. And that's what I'll be doing for most of the year. Having simplified my life, you know, just generally need a lot less money. So it's partly simplifying and needing a lot less money. And then it's humans exchanging, you know. I bring value by inspiring people in the community and they're happy for me to stay with them. And of course, they want me to because they're inspired by my work and so we get to spend time together and and such. 
have you planned for after the year of speaking what you're going to do for housing? Nope, I do not know what's ahead for that. I know I'll be traveling for probably the next year and a half or so. I'm not sure where I'll be next place I will live. I am planning on duplicating my recent project in Florida of a year without grocery stores or restaurants growing and foraging all my food. And I am planning on doing that in a temperate climate, in Wisconsin, New York, a colder climate, as some would say. Could be Wisconsin or New York or something like that. And could build a tiny house again or could live on a farm in a structure that's already existing. That is something that I will know when it happens. You got a lot of time to figure it all out. Let's dig into this year-long experiment before we let you go here and talk about Orlando, Florida. You went there, it was November 11, 2018. And again, like we've talked about, you were growing and foraging all your food for a year. Just to start off, why Orlando? Was there a certain draw there or what made you go there? I chose Florida because I wanted to be in a warm place. And as a rookie, I had very little experience growing or foraging my food. And so I wanted to be in a place where it would be easier. And I had the year round growing season so that I could make mistakes and have the ability. And then also just on a personal level, I like to be in warm places. I grew up in Wisconsin and I left Wisconsin for a reason. And that was partly because I like to be in warm places. And so that was another reason that I chose Florida. Orlando in particular, I found a huge movement of permaculturists there who had food forests in their yards. And there was a big movement of people turning their front yards into gardens. It was a great hub with lots of resources to learn from and plug into so that I'd be able to pull this project off. Right. So the community there really embraced you? Yeah. The other thing was, as I was visiting, I visited there twice and gave talks, I think both times on previous speaking tours. And both times, my partner and I just felt super embraced by the community. Yeah. People, when we said that we're looking for the next place to live, so many people said, make it Orlando, please. So we felt really welcomed and desired there. Before this whole year started, you actually took a period of time to go there and and get situated. So I think it was 10 months in the end you spent leading up to that. And what exactly were you doing? Was that when you're building the tiny house? Yeah. So the idea of growing and foraging all my food for a year definitely required preparation because I couldn't start on day one with no garden and no experience. I mean, maybe you could do that, but I certainly didn't have the skill set for it. So I gave myself a period of time to start my gardens, to you know, learn, to go to lots of workshops and classes, read a lot of books, watch things online, and the whole time as I'm learning, putting it into practice. So as soon as I arrived in Orlando, within a couple of weeks, I started growing food. I started to turn my first front yard into a garden. I had made a little greenhouse to get things started. And the idea was that on day one, I would already have established gardens and I'd have food growing around the neighborhood and I'd already have scouted out where food grows because that's the reality, you know, for someone who's going to try to actually live off the land and grow and forage all their food and live without grocery stores. The reality is is that they're probably going to have been situated in that spot for more than a year, probably more than five years before jumping into it. But yeah, so that was the idea was to give myself time to get into it. Again, speaking of community, when it came time to build the tiny house, I think it was about 40 people ended up helping you put it together, right? Yeah, I turned it into a basically a workshop, an activity. And people came for many reasons, some because they're interested in building their own tiny house. So they got to be a part of it for the first time. Some because it was a bunch of like minded people. So it was fun for them. You know, some of the volunteers worked really hard. Some just kind of hung out and talked to people. But all in all, it was as I like to do, I like to create scenarios where everybody is benefiting and learning and growing. And that's definitely what we had through the volunteer days of putting the the tiny house together. By the end of it, when things were all put together and fully functional, how many different gardens did you have your hands in? I built six gardens around the neighborhood and two were entire front yard gardens where I really transformed the place. And then another was pretty big. And then three of them were just like little patches where I planted easy crops that I didn't need to go to, but once a month to check out. I planted some calorie crops like cassava, where you can just plant those and come back in a year. And then there's plenty of food growing there. Over the course of the whole year, what was the biggest challenge for you? 
the entire thing was extremely challenging. You know, for a year, no grocery stores or restaurants, nothing packaged or processed. The convenience food that we have built into our life, none of that. No multivitamins. And I had to literally everything that I ate for the entire year, I had to either grow or go out into nature and collect it. It's a very much time commitment and just all around a challenge. Throughout the year, how close did you get to giving up? Was there any close calls? I don't think I ever like came close to actually giving up. There were definitely moments where I thought about it and moments of despair. But I don't think I ever was actually going to give up. It came across my mind multiple or many times. I definitely had my struggles and my down times. I do feel like overall the project went extremely well. And I finished off weighing the same amount as I started, so I didn't lose any weight. I mean, honestly, when I ended the project, ended the year, I actually felt healthier than when I started, which I think is an amazing testament. I didn't end up getting blood tests like I had planned. But I felt great, which is pretty darn meaningful to me. Most people thought I wouldn't be able to do it. Others thought I would basically survive. But I would say that I came out happier and healthier than when I started. That's amazing. And by the end, were you just counting down the days? Or if this was a year and a half or two year experiment, do you think you could have endured? I was definitely counting down the days the whole time. Like no question about it. And I kept track of everything that I ate. Like every day I logged my food. So there was practical reasons why I was counting down the days and keeping track of the days. But no doubt, it was extremely challenging and I did count down the days. Could I have continued? Mm, Not in the setting that I was in. Being in the city of Orlando, I was tired of the busyness and the noisiness. And so, so no, I wouldn't have been able to continue because of just factors of life, of wanting to travel, of wanting to get out of there. But I definitely think that someone myself or others could set things up in a way where they definitely could do this as a life, not just a year long project. And the thing is, a lot of people think that they're just like, oh, yeah, most of the world is doing that. But it's not. That's a disconnection to our food system and to humanity. Even in most places where where a lot of people are living in great poverty, those people are not growing and foraging all their food. Most of them are dependent upon global commodities, whether it's grains like corn or sugar. And the reality is, is that the Western food system where we need so much, we've actually taken them from being able to live off their land because we've taken their land and created global commodities and taken people away from their customary way of living. So the reality is, is that it's been an interesting thing, but I I personally can't find communities of people that are living completely off of the land around them. I'm sure that some exist, but they are really in today's globalized world, few and far between. Well, Rob, normally we end the show asking the guests, what does ultimate health mean to you? But you've already answered that. So I'm going to leave you with this. How do you personally stay optimistic in today's chaotic world? I do look at the bigger picture and I do know what's going on in the bigger picture, but I don't take responsibility for the world. I choose to take responsibility for my own life. I don't think that we're going to fix all of our global problems I don't think that everything's going to work out for humanity. I think that life is always going to be challenging and more challenging times are to come than we're dealing with now for our global humanity. But that doesn't get me down because I'm not responsible for that and I can't control that. The thing is, it doesn't matter for me what's going to happen necessarily in 100 years or 300 years or 500 years. But what matters is how I can live in a way that impacts the people around me. And the reason why is because I believe that life matters. My life matters, the life of my friends and family, people I haven't met, anybody around the world, the other species, life matters. So if I can live in a way where I bring value to other people's lives, where I don't steal from them, where I live in a way that's fair and just, then that's meaningful. If I can increase quality of life for the life that exists now, then that's something that I can feel good about and that I can keep doing day after day. Well, that's a beautiful way to wrap up. And Rob, other than listeners going to your YouTube channel, and I've spent countless hours watching your videos. They're very informative, inspiring, entertaining. How can they connect with you after the show? Yeah, definitely. I post quite a bit on Instagram. So that's just at Rob J. Greenfield. Or if you type in Rob Greenfield, I'm sure I'll pop up. YouTube is where I post videos, a lot of the longer videos that go deeper into these topics, and then Facebook as well. My website's also just robgreenfield.org. There's a blog about almost everything that we talked about today that goes deeper into it. 
and that are tool guides to help people follow, you know, their dreams of living more sustainably and more healthfully and consciously. Well, I love your mission. Really enjoyed the conversation and wish you all the best. Thanks so much for having me on. I, I really enjoyed the conversation as well. And hopefully one of these days we'll get to have a conversation in person, whether it's in Canada or somewhere around the world. I'm sure we will. Take care, Rob. Thank you. Take care. What a fun and interesting conversation with Rob. He is living such a unique lifestyle. I really enjoyed preparing for this one and our chat, and I hope you did too. So be sure and tag us over on Instagram at Ultimate Health Podcast and at Rob J. Greenfield. And you can tag a photo of yourself, a video of yourself, or the player. And be sure and share what you took from today's episode and what you really enjoyed. And also, we have full show notes, as always, over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 344. So we have links to everything we discussed today and a show summary, so be sure and check that out. And before we let you go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jay Sanderson, over at podcasttech.com. Jay, you do such a great job putting the show together. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that him and his wife, Edith, they recently visited her family for an end of winter family feast. Good food and family all together in one event. You really can't beat it. Have an awesome week. We'll talk soon. Wishing you ultimate health.